We came from Caladan, a paradise world for our form of life. There existed no need on Caladan to build a physical paradise, or a paradise of the mind. We could see the actuality all around us. And the price we paid was the price men have always paid for achieving a paradise in this life. We went soft. We lost our edge. From Muhadib Conversations by the Princess Irulan. Welcome to Reading Dune, a podcast where we read Dune by Frank Herbert and talk about it. If you're a Fremen or a first-time reader, this podcast is for you. My name is Caleb Pauls. And I'm Evan Diaz. And together, we're going to read some Dune. Yes, we are. Yeah. All right, Evan. Um, at the beginning of most of our shows now, we'd like to share a little uh, audience favorite. What is their favorite moment um, mm-hmm. from Dune so far? And so we ask people to email us at readingduna gmail.com. Send us in uh, type type it out if you want, or like send a voice recording and we'll put it on the show or a video, put it on the show. And I have an email from Luke Mortensen. All right. He says, Hey guys, Luke Mortensen from British Columbia, Canada here. There you go. Let's We're go. Here. We're international, folks. <laughs> My favorite Dune moment so far was probably when Paul learned he's Harkonnen. Ooh, yes. Luke says, uh, I thought it was a perfect way to represent the balance of his struggle up until this moment. When he gets visions of what could be all in the possible futures, and it's interesting to see him wrestle with all the possibilities that he could become. The struggle of good and evil, it definitely gives me some Darth Vader, I am your father vibes. Whoa. It made me wonder if Star Wars might have borrowed the old family reveal card uh, from that. So cool to see how many seeds this book has created in the science fiction genre. I look forward to reading along with you guys and eagerly await each week as you guys dig into a new chapter. Keep up the good work and stay spicy. Your Sweet. Northern Fremen pal, Luke. Thanks, Luke. What a guy. BC. Yeah, that moment when uh, he, Paul learns he's Harkonnen really does uh, put everything into like perspective. Yeah, for sure. He like when he wakes up whispering like Harkonnen shall kill Harkonnen. Oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, also like I like what Luke talked about the uh, the connections between like stuff in Star Wars and other sci-fi and. Uh, and Dune, I'm starting to see it more and more as we're like deeper in the book. We're about halfway, well, oh, a little more than halfway through. A little more and, than halfway through. And I've been re-watching, I, st- I watched Star Wars like chronologically recently. I'm like, uh-huh. um, I'm in the sequels now and I keep seeing something. I'm like, that's from Dune, that's from Dune. I'm watching Mandalorian. I'm like, that is from Dune. That is great directly taken out of tune. <laughs> the giant sandworm? Yeah. Dude. Like, that was... <laughs> they, it, like, came out and I was like, okay, seriously? <laughs> yes. This is not yours, Lucasfilm. That is straight out of Arrakis. But they can do whatever they want. They're Lucasfilm. Right. No, yeah, you really do see... What, what, other, what other connections have you seen from, say, Star Wars? Um... There's like, especially watching Mandalorian, like there's a lot of desert stuff happening and you can see like even culturally when you're in desert places like, like Tatooine or uh, uh, where Ray is from, where's Ray from? Uh, Jakku. Ja- yeah, Jakku. Like there's all the cultural stuff of that just like has a, an Arakeen feel to it, you know? No. Um, the scavenger kind of vibes, you know, the like fight to survive and like, I don't know. The oppression, the oppression is big. Like the political oppression that's happening. Uh, I think of the scene where Ray is like trading scraps for like that weird bubbly bread food crap. Right. Um, and obviously like the empire, there's, there's so much, there's so many like little connections. So okay, here's a here's a random trivia. What, um, Han Solo, right? He, well, Jabba the Hutt was looking for him because 
uh, what did he he dump when the Empire showed up? So the he, job he was doing a job for Jabba the Hutt, and he dumped the product as soon as the Empire showed up, and Jabba was after him, which is the reason he needed to take the job because he needed to get the credits back right. to Jabba. What was the the thing he was the product he was hauling? Was it spice? It did was he spice. It was spice. And in the sequel trilogy, you have um, oh, who does um. Golly, I just lost his name. This is really bad of me. The guy who's going to play Duke Lido. What's his name? Yes. Uh, oh, Poe Dameron? Poe. Yeah, what was his job before he joined the Rebels? Was he a spice trader? He was a spice runner. He was a spice smuggler. Oh, do we think it's the same spice? I don't think so, but the connection and the word spice is just very... Makes you go, hmm... Yeah, couldn't have, couldn't have thought of another another word. You had to use spice, really. Well, speaking of spice smugglers, um, that's where we're at in this chapter. Yeah, that is true. Do you like my transition there? I, no, I no, no. masterful, a masterful transition. Um, uh, to be honest, when I uh, when I open the chapter, right, you see Gurney Halleck's name right away first on the page, and so you kind of know. It's about Gurney. Yeah. And part of me is irritated because I just want to know what happens with Paul and Jessica. Yeah. Yeah, but like also when I read Gurney's name, I like literally sighed in relief. You know, just like, oh, Gurney's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Gurney is okay. I relate, like, I think, on a personal level with Gurney. Weathered minstrel. And he was full of quotes. Shredding on his ballast. So um, this chapter kind of is reminiscent of the Thufer chapter. Mm -hmm. Thufer talks to the Fremen. We get to see who the Fremen are. Uh, in this chapter, we get Gurney talking to the smugglers. So right. now we get to see who the smugglers are because they're the last people group we really don't know that operate on the planet. Yeah, and they have a kind of in-between vibe. That's what I was getting. There's like, not Fremen, but not like Caladan folk. He's, they're somewhere in between. Yes, they are def they definitely have a half Fremen feel. Yeah. Um, so we start this chapter in the middle of a conversation. Wait, hold up. Do you want to talk about the quote real quick? I feel like the quote, there was a bunch of good juice in there. Yes, yes, yes. And it's only, it's so funny because in this chapter, we talk about the Duke and kind of like what has changed and how just how different Arrakis and Caladan are. Yeah. And what, what the difference does to a person. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I love this quote. I was about to take a photo. I think I might still do this, but I was about to take a photo of this quote and send it to uh, this mentor of mine and show him like, cause he kind of thinks, I don't know. He's like made fun of us for our podcast. I don't care. I love our podcast. It's super fun, but I wanted to show him this quote because it's so like, yes, you know, we lost our edge because we yeah. went soft. When you have, when you're too comfortable, look what you lose that fighting spirit. Right. Right. And there's so much, there's so much of that to our Western affluent lifestyle. Even if you're just kind of like middle class, lower middle class in America, like having grown, having grown up in Brazil and having seen such like tangible poverty for a good chunk of my life, you, you look at America and you're like, dang, we kind of we kind of have everything. I mean, we, we're not devoid of problems, obviously, but there is access. You know, like we have so much access. We still have a lot of poverty, but there's so much. Like, I go to the grocery store, I buy this. You know, like there's there's so much available to us that's just like not available in other places, and you see just a different level of fortitude in some of these other places. Um, Caleb and I, 
you guys, you guys don't know all our, all our stories, and we're not trying to tell you all our stories. But we've been we've been around the world a handful of times and seen a lot of stuff. And there's just it's a different breed of human beings in a lot of the places that we've been because you know you you go through hardship in life, real, true, difficult hardship, and it does it does something in you that that being in a easy place like america just you can't do it does that make sense yeah i would i'm reminded of um i saw an article it was like uh, the top 50 like ceos and startups and entrepreneurs and like how much they money they made um and over half of them were immigrants wow so it's this idea of like actually the hard struggle can is it does more for you than taking it easy in the privilege route and thinking you can have it all. Yeah. Um, that these, these people know how to work and struggle and it, uh, they get paid for it. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, this quote is, is on Caladan. They got comfortable. Yes. It was hard. Yes. They had to fight jungle monsters or whatever, but they, lost their edge yeah and when they were presented with a problem like arrakis it chewed them up Mm -hmm. rather fast yeah Um, and so now we're we're in the repercussions of that Mm. and it just makes me think my own life when when people when i get too comfortable that's definitely not when i'm most my most creative or when i'm not I don't like love myself the most when it's like super comfortable. I get bored and, and lazy. And so, yeah, you got, you need that edge. Oh, for sure. For sure. You got to fight for it. Fight for it. And we're, really? fight, we're fighting men just like oh, Gurney Halleck. That was my punching sounds to our listeners. It sounded like Donald Duck. <laughs> so we'll work on that. Come back next chapter. Picture Donald Duck in his little petty <laughs> stance. <laughs> All right. So back to Dune. Okay, you got it. All right. So Gurney and his band of men were picked up by the smugglers. Um, it was evidently that the Gurney's men were fighting Harkonnens. They were running away. They were doing something, and the smugglers saw them and swooped them up and took them to the smuggler CH. Ah. Because if they left them behind, they would be at the mercy of the Harkonnens. Yeah. Which brings uh, the question, did they swoop them up as trying to save them or more as prisoners or somewhere in between? uh, Less as prisoners, because you're going to see that in this chapter, um, Staban, the head of this CH, um, is trying to recruit Gurney and his men to come join them become smugglers with us Mm -hmm. the atreides are gone if you try to fight the harkonnens that's a unwinnable battle you could go to the fremen but living with the fremen might be harder than you actually want right you could just come work for us yeah just hang out we have yeah in the chapter it says we have we have water green grass women just stay here it's good um, and so you have this conversation between Ga- uh, Gurney and Staban um, as they're trying to recruit them back and forth. And so this right. is the conversation. Let's do it. All right. Um, Gurney kind of walks in, or he's he's in this the the office at this CH, and across there at the table at this metal desk is Staban Tuik, son of Esmar Tuik. You remember Esmar? Yeah, that was the the first Tuik. Yeah, they just, they just said Tuik in that. Right. Yeah, he was he was in the dinner the dinner party. He was murdered by uh, uh, Yui. Yeah, he was one of the people we met. Yeah, he was the one that I thought in my brain could be Jason Momoa, but it was not Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa is Idaho. Right. Okay, and now. Also, just before we start, for our readers that are like reading along and don't have that have like little context like I do, I just started picturing Gurney as uh, a Jack Black character. 
Okay. I don't know why. Imagine I mean, Jack Black being Gurney Halleck with this little rock in the ballast set. Got this ink vine scar on his on his cheek. Yeah. They call they call him a, an ugly man. So I mean, Jack Black's kind of good looking. So you might need to find another guy there. I don't know. <laughs> that's how i'm picturing him until we get into the movie realm it's gonna be a jack blackie a serious role for jack black which i think would be interesting but yeah it would be good um so halleck says to staban then you're the one i owe thanks for the help we've received ah gratitude the smuggler says sit down <laughs> and has he and as he says this, this is the very opposite of the Baron Harkonnen who makes the Beast Ravon stand the whole time. Right. A, a chair emerges from the side of the wall and Halleck sinks into it with a sigh, feeling the heaviness and the weariness. And so then he starts a conversation to see if maybe this is a place where him and his people can be. Are, mm -hmm. are the smugglers good people? Um. Halleck says, your men tell me your father is dead, killed by the Harkonnens. By the Harkonnens or by a traitor among your people, Stu Tuick said. Whoop. Well, we know the answer to that one. Yeah. Anger overcame part of Halleck's fatigue. He straightened. Can you name the traitor? Mm, we are not sure. Through for how it suspected Lady Jessica. Ah, the Bene Gesserit witch, perhaps. But how it's now a Harkonnen captive? Ruh -ruh. I heard. Halleck took a deep breath. It appears we deal more killing ahead of us. We will do nothing to attract attention to us, Tuick said. Halleck stiffened. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, we're not going to go kill more people? But, 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 but. Tuick says... You and those your men were saved are welcome to sanctuary among, a, among us. You speak of gratitude very well. Work off your debt to us. We can always use good men. And we'll destroy you out of hand, though, if you make the slightest open move against the Harkonnens. If you do anything, do not mess up the status quo. That is the guild's, or the, sorry, that's what the smugglers want more than anything else, because that's what the guild wants more than anything else. Right. The spice must flow. Yeah. And we can see, I'm like seeing the difference between the way the Fremen talk to Thufir and the way that this smuggler is talking to Howitt. There's like obviously a culture change, you know, like don't mess with the status quo. Don't go to, you know, like he's, there's, it's all selfish. Interest. There's definitely more money involved. Yeah, it's all about keeping the money flowing. Whereas the, I think the Fremen are more, how would you say this, uh, more religious in how they think about it. Right. Yeah. They're not going anywhere. They don't care. They have their goals, but overall, they will, they will win. Um. So Gurney was like, "Wait, but they've killed your father. Aren't you going to avenge your father?" And. Tuick says, perhaps, and if so, I give you my father's answer to those who act without thinking. A stone is heavy and the sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Boom! Dun 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 dun. Alex sneers back at him. You mean to do nothing? Saban's number one goal here is to protect the contract the smugglers have with the guild. Yeah. So he, sa he says, you don't hear me say that. I merely say I will protect our contract with the guild. The guild requires that we play circumspect, a circumspect game. There are other ways to, to destroy a foe. Uh. That's, what, that's what Gurney says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so who do you think the guild gets their spice from? The smugglers? Yeah, or the smugglers Fremen. and the Fremen. And, and the Fremen? Them. Yeah, they got them both. Right. So why does the guild need so much spice? Uh, to do whatever weirdo mutated space person crap that they're doing and keep 
their weird space mutant people alive? Yes, because without this weird space mutant people, they can't fold space. Or they, they can't, they can fold space, but now they can't track to see what it is. So they need the spice. You know how Paul like saw all possible yeah. realities? That's what the, um, the guild kind of does. They see all possible routes and then they like pick the right one and then they yeah. fold time through it. Or fold so it's like for Paul, it's like a future like this transcendent version of kind of like this, the, the guild has like numbers to crunch and they can yeah. only crunch that level of numbers with the spice. So it's like more of a scientific kind of thing. And Paul has more of like a spiritual kind of, I think, I think it's both. Party. Okay. Cause the guild, um, they know. Yeah. They, they, they probably are aware something's up um, at this moment. Okay. They they but they need it so they can keep their monopoly on space travel and spice is the only thing that does it for them. There's been no artificial substance that can mimic what spice does. Yeah. So, yes. So he says there's another way to destroy a foe. And so then Tuix says, I mean, if you have the mind to seek out the Bene Gesserit witch, if if Jessica's the one you think did it, Go ahead, have at it. But I warn you, you're probably too late. And we doubt that she's the one you want anyway. And at this, Gurney comes to Howitt's defense. How it makes few mistakes. And then Tuig reminds him that uh, he allowed himself to fall into Harkonnen hands. And this is where, like, Gurney's like, wait, do you think Howitt is the traitor? Tuig shrugs. This is academic. We think the witch is dead. At least that's what the Harkonnens believe. This is where Gurney's getting suspicious. You seem to know a great deal about the Harkonnens. I mean, in Gurney's defense, I'm also suspicious at this point. <laughs> right. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Maybe maybe they gave up the Atreides, but they're, they're very much... They don't care who's in charge of Arrakis. Um, and this is where I think it's really funny. He says... Tuix says, hints and suggestions, rumors and hunches. You remember how the Fremen don't say no? This is that really similar. I'm not going to tell you no. Right. Just, just uh, yeah. Yeah, but Kynes, Kynes did the same thing, right? He right. He was like, oh, people, people talk, you know, like, what are you going to do? But he never said, like, that's not true. Ru- yeah, superstition, rumors. People, people say things. Right. He definitely doesn't come down on a, on a yes or a no. Right. Um, and even Idaho said, yeah, Fre- Fremen don't like to say no. That's, you know, how far will this be? Well, I mean, we can go. I don't know if you'll live, but we can go. <laughs> like, <laughs> is that where you want to go? Um, but yeah, this is that, that instance where the, the smugglers feel very Fremen. In their feeling, right? They have the half blue eyes. They're wearing Fremen robes. They're still like that that weird that weird thing that uh, I think the desert does to you. Yeah. When you're in this environment, you start adapting right. in, order, in order to survive. Which is which is was tricky for me reading this chapter because I was reading what Tuik is saying and like hearing it in that like Fremen voice, but I was like but it's not quite the words, you know, like I feel like right. he would sound like a Fremen, but he wouldn't be saying what a Fremen would be saying. Yes. So, uh, Halleck then presents his, his chips, right? He says, uh, we are 74 men, 74 men in, in Gurney's company. And he says, if you're serious that we should enlist with the smugglers, you must believe the Duke to be dead. And this is where Tuik says, his body has been seen. And Halleck says, wait, and the boy too? Young Master Paul? Halleck tried to swallow, found a lump in his throat. According to the last word we had, he was lost with his mother in the desert storm. Likely, not even their bones will ever be found. Yikes. So the witch is dead then. All dead. Tuik nodded. 
And Beast Brew Bond, so they say, will sit once more on the seat of power here on Dune. I like how he calls it Dune. Not many people have called it Dune yet. Right. It's always kind of referred to as Arrakis. Yeah. This is that moment where... um, it's, a, the, it's the old family guy joke where they, Peter Griffin says he likes to go to movies um, where they say the name of the movie in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, he said it. He said it. He said it. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> um, but how, so we know that Beast Bon is going to take and be in charge. And uh, Halleck has a score to settle with the Beast. Do you know, do you remember why? Why? Um, I don't remember why, but I remember reading about it in this chapter. Okay, what's he say? Um, Raban mm, killed his family and gave him that pretty scar of his. Yeah, yeah. In a raid, uh, he took, he killed the whole family, very much in like a, a Thanos moment. Yeah, you know, we kind of did that. And cut his. Yeah, cut his face up. And so uh, the Duke saved Gurney. And in that moment, that's when Gurney gave the Duke like his allegiance. So this is a big deal for him to like. It's like now that the Duke is out of the way, there's another. He's got a, he's got a vendetta, a revenge he needs to take out, which yeah. is the beast. Um, but Tuvix says. One does not risk everything to settle a score prematurely, Tuix says. He frowned, watching the, mus- the play of muscles along Halleck's jaw. Sudden sudden withdrawal of a man's shed-lidden eyes. I know, I know. Halleck took a deep breath. Then he tries to divert his attention again, away from the beast. He says, uh, you and your men can work out your passage off Arrakis by serving with us, Right? Come work with us. We'll uh, you will pay you enough so you can you know to go and do your own thing. And Gurney says, "No, I release my men from any bond to me. They can choose for themselves. With her bond here, I stay." This is where Tuix says something I really like. He says, "In your mood, I'm not sure we want you to stay. <laughs> You're kind of hot right now, dude." <laughs> I, did, did you not get what we just said? Like, calm down. Status quo. Nothing changes. Don't do anything. And then ha- Halleck just stares back. He says, you doubt my word? And then Stabon's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I don't doubt you at all, man. <laughs> Gurney, you saved me from the Harkonnens. I gave loyalty to Duke Leto. For no greater reason, I stay on Arrakis with you or with the Fremen. With the Fremen. Which Gurney knows nothing about the Fremen. At the nothing. Time. He knows absolutely nothing about the Fremen. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Gurney would survive with the Fremen. You don't? I just, I don't know. They're, they're pretty hardcore. And uh, Tuik doesn't think he'll survive either. Yeah. But Gurney's pretty hardcore. He's 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 pretty hardcore, but that's it, it's a it's a nice edge. Yeah, being with the Fremen. As even Tuix says, you might find the line between life and death among the Fremen a bit too sharp and quick. <laughs> Halleck closed his eyes briefly, feeling his weariness surge up in him, and then he has a quote. He murmurs to himself. Where is the Lord who leads us through the land of deserts and pits? He murmurs. He says a quick prayer. Do you know where that quote's from? No. Jer- Jeremiah 2.6. Wow. That's like straight out of Jeremiah? You just legit copy paste. Wow. Well, yeah, this is the, uh, the NIV version says, they did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through barren wilderness, through the lands of deserts and ravines, the land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. Dang, <laughs> that was more intense than the Dune version. <laughs> NIV people, New International, none of that King James stuff. 
We're all too triggered by the King James version. Anyway. <laughs> Anywho. Um, but yes, where where is the, the the God who walk us through this? And then Tuak reminds him, move slowly and the day of your revenge will come. Speed is a device of shaitan. Cool your sorrow. Weave diversions for it. Three things that ease the heart. Water, green grass, and the beauty of a woman. Halleck looks up at him, opens his eyes. I would prefer the blood of Raban Harkonnen flowing about my feet. He stared at Tuik. You think that day will come? And then again, Stavon is doing a great job just deflecting this whole time. Right. And I love all these quotes because they're so, I don't know, ambiguous, but they're they're pretty good. He says, uh, I have little to do with how you'll meet tomorrow, Gurney Halleck. I can only help you meet today. Gosh, it's so in between, like, his words. It's, it's, it's like, freaking me out a little bit. It's like, there's an air of Fremen, like, truth to it, but there's also, like, I don't like I don't like the uh, uh, clear sorrow. We've the diversions for it. It's like right diversions. That's not that's not how you're supposed to do things on Arrakis, right? Right. Yeah. Then, then there's that air of uh, how the smugglers are just slightly different. They they yeah. own up that they're in this world, but they don't want to be in this world. Yeah. Whereas the Fremen are in the world of the world. Yeah. Um, they know this just makes the money, and this is what they need to do. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's the, I can, it's a good salesman. Like I, I can't help you with tomorrow, but if you sign the document right now here, we might have a deal for you. Very salesman. -y. It's sketchy. It's slimy for sure. It's like a wet still suit. <laughs> so then Gurney still, I think they're, they're still selling back and forth. Like Gurney is like, well, then will you help me? kill the beast like he killed your father like come on there's got to be some sort of thing we can work out here he says then i'll accept that you'll help and stay until the day you tell me to revenge your father and all the others who he gets interrupted listen to me fighting man tuick said he leans forward over the desk his shoulders level with his ears eyes intent the smuggler's face was suddenly like a weathered stone. My father's water, I'll buy that back myself with my own blade. <laughs> he called it water. That's another like Fremen thing. Right. They know. Hmm. And this is where Halleck just stares back, meets him eye to eye. And in that moment... He's reminded of somebody. He, he sees the courageous uh, attitude that the Duke Leto had before Arrakis. Yes. Not on Arrakis, before Arrakis. And when he sees that, he says, oh, okay. If you're this kind of person, then I'm in. Do you wish my blade with you? Halleck asked. And then Tuik knows he has the upper hand. Sits back, relaxes. Studies Halleck silently. You know, lets him think. Sit there. So Halleck says something again. Do you think of me as a fighting man? Tuik says. Arms crossed probably at this point in time too. Right. You're, the only, you're the only one of the Duke's lieutenants to escape. You know, the mighty Mentat didn't do it. Swordsman Duncan didn't do it. Your doctor didn't do it. The Bene Gesserit witch didn't do it. You're the only one. You, um, your enemy was overwhelming, yet you rolled with him. You defeated him the way we defeat Arrakis. How does he? Do, how do uh, the smugglers defeat Arrakis, Evan? How did Gurney beat the Harkonnens in this instance? I got nothing. I don't know. By running away. Ah. Oh. Yeah. 
You only you only win one enemy at a time. Don't go up against the whole force. You live today and today only. I hate that. I hate that. I mean, desert, desert, desert planet. I guess, but it's like, yeah, it's totally not. I don't know. I'm liking the Fremen a lot more. I don't know. Well, it takes the valor out of it, right? There's no. Right. You don't feel good about just scraping by. Right. Um, you want to kind of make money. It's all that matters. Yeah. Han Solo lifestyle right there. Just one one thing at a time. Yeah. Um, but then Gurney asks, wait, like, wait, is that how the Fremen do it? Is that how the, is that how the, is that the Fremen way to live? And the two shrugs his shoulders, perhaps. And then uh, Gurney's still trying to think. He says, you said I might find life with the Fremen too tough. They live in the desert, in the open. Is that why? Tuik, who knows where the Fremen live? For us, the central plateau is no man's land. But I wish to talk about more. And then Halleck is on something. He's like, wait a minute. I'm told that Guild seldom routes spice lighters over the desert. But there are rumors you can see bits of green here and there. Rumors, Tuik sneered. It's that same thing. That's rumors. Do you wish to choose now between me or the Fremen? We have a measure of security, our own siege, carved out of rock, our own hidden basins. We live the lives of civilized men. The Fremen are a few of ragged bands that we use as spice hunters. So the Fremen probably sell to the smugglers who probably sell to the guild. Right. Um, but this, the Fremen can do something incredible. They can kill Harkonnens, you know? The smugglers don't want to kill Harkonnens, but at least the Fremens, we know they will. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what Gurney says, but at least they kill Harkonnens. And Tuik responds, but do you wish to know the results? Sure, they kill Harkonnens, but even now they're being hunted down with like animals with laser guns because they don't have shields. They're being exterminated. Why? Because they killed Harkonnens. He's selling, dude. He's selling super hard right now. Right. Like, if you want to kill Harkonnens, you're going to meet the same fate. But he's also, like, lying. Like, we know that he's lying. I mean, they don't wear shields. And, yeah, they're being... They, when the Beast was there and will do again, he hunts the Fremen. Like, like sport. Yeah. But it's like... He's, he's maybe twisting the truth. He's trying to get Gurney to sign up with him. So he's like, they kill Harkonnens, but they're being hunted. And like the Fremen, <laughs> generally when we meet them, they're like fine. You know, like yeah. they're like, we're cool. We just killed a couple of guard and we're just hanging out. You need some water? We get you some water, you know? But he's making it, he's making them out to be savages and, you know, that's not that's not the whole truth. Gurney's being uh, being swindled here. Oh, he's for sure being swindled in this. Um, but I think Tuik actually know like he thinks he's given a better offer. Yeah, um, and that's where Halak was like, "Was it the Harkonnens that the Fremen killed?" And Tuik's like, "What do you mean?" And then Gurney as he leads on like, "Do you think there were Sardaukar with the Harkonnens?" And again, Tuik responds, "More rumors." It's rumors. We don't know these things for facts. And then he says, make your choice again, fighting man. I promise you, Sanctuary, a chance to draw blood. If we both want, be sure of that. The Fremen will only offer you a life of the hunted. Halleck hesitated, sensing wisdom and sympathy in Tuix's words. Get troubled for no reason he could explain. And I think it's that's his, his intuition knows that Paul, if Paul would be alive, the place he would go would be to the Fremen. Right. And if there is some inkling that his allegiance to the Duke is alive, the Duke would be Paul, and that's where he should go. But he doesn't know if he's alive, and everybody's dead now. So, hey, Tuik leans into this moment. Trust your own abilities. Whose decisions brought you the force through the battle? Yours. So decide. 
And then Halleck, he's thinking, the Duke and his son must be dead. Tuick says that's what the Harkonnens believe. Where things are considered, I ain't going to trust the Harkonnens. A grim smile touched Tuick's mouth. But it's about the only trust I give them. So then Halleck says he's, he's given in. It must be. He held out his right hand, palm up, and thumb folded flat against it. Palm up, thumb folded flat against it. Like that. Yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, we're making the gesture. Yeah. If not, mm -hmm. our palms are up and our thumbs are rested flatly on it. I give you my sword. Weird. And then Tuick says, accepted. You're in. And then Alex says, do you wish me to persuade my men? And Tuick kind of looks at him. Like, what do you, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, they, they followed you this far. Like, what? Um, and then Gurney says, Arrakis isn't what they thought it would be. Here they've lost everything except their own lives. I'd prefer they make the decision for themselves. And then Tuick's like, wait, no, 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 no. Just make a decision. They followed you this far. Well, if they're with you, they're with you. And that's where Gurney gets it. He goes, aha, you need the men. Is right. that it? And Tuick doesn't say no here. Again, he just says, we could use some experience fighting men in these times more than ever. <laughs> and then he, he, Tuick then responds with, I think they'll follow you, Gurney Halleck. And Gurney's like, I sure hope so. So, so then G Halleck pushed himself up from the bucket seat, fully aligning himself with the smugglers at this point, feeling how much reserve strength even in the small effort required. For now, I'll see to their quarters and well-being, he said. Tuick says, all right, consult my quartermaster. Tell him it's my wish that you receive every courtesy. I'll join you myself presently. I have just some off shipments of spice to see first. Halleck, fortune passes everywhere. Everywhere, Tuick says. A time of upset is a rare opportunity in our business. Halleck nodded, heard the faint susurration and felt the air shift of the lock port swing open beside him. He turned, ducked through it, and out of the office. Evan, do you think, uh, where do you think they got that extra shipment of spice from? I didn't think about that. Fortune passes everywhere. Where'd they pick up the extra spice up from? Wasn't in the ground. Did they steal it from somebody? Was it a trady spice? Oh man. What? I didn't even I didn't even think about that at all. I thought they were just like business as usual. Well, for them it is. It's just now we uh the tradies are gone, so they're not using this. We'll use it. Right. Yikes. See, I'm not I'm not a fan of this Tuick. The other Tuick was funny and kind of like cool. This guy sucks, man. I don't like this guy. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sorry that your beloved Gurney is now on Team Smugglers. Uh, it sucks. This but so this last scene in this chapter is really sweet. It is. Um, it kind of shows who Gurney is a little more, a little more of his character. So he walks out to his men in the assembly hall. Um, Halleck no noted a touch of pride with his men who were, who were all able to stand. Everybody who could stand was standing. Anybody, anybody who couldn't stand was held up by an Atreides, so they all were standing. Right. And that's where he sees, ah, that's the Atreides training. We care for our own. It held like a core, a oh, it held like a core of native rock in them, Halleck noted, right? The Atreides don't give up on each other. One of the one of his lieutenants steps forward, carrying Halleck's nine-string ballast out of its cage. The man snapped a salute and said, sir, the medics here say there's no hope from a tie. They have no bone or organ banks here, only outpost medicine. Matai can't last. They say he has a request for you. First of all, uh, at an outpost, they don't have organ banks or bone. So if they were in like a regular city, you could just get a whole new bones put in and new organs and casual. Yeah, you can put robot eyes in if you need to. Wow. You know, you just 
replace the parts. Um, we haven't gotten that far in that. You're not going to see any of those here, but you can in the Dune universe. Sweet. Yeah. But there's a, Gurney has a request. What is it? The lieutenant thrusts the ballast set forward. Matai wants a song to ease his going, sir. He says you'll know the one. He's asked of you often enough. The lieutenant swallowed. It's the one called My Woman, sir. If you... I know. Halleck took the ballast set, flicked out the multi-pick out of its cat to the fingerboard. He drew a soft chord from the instrument, found it, someone had already tuned it. There was burning in his eyes, but he drove that out of his thoughts as he strolled forward, strumming the tune, forcing himself to smile casually. Several of his men and one smuggler medic were bent over the leaders. One of the men began singing softly as Halleck approached. So Havoc plays, another man sings, as they're all standing around Matai. Would you wanna you wanna do me the favors, Evan? You wanna say the song? I'm gonna read it. I could not. That's why I said say it. I'm okay, not gonna okay, cool. <laughs> I'm not gonna <laughs> force you it. on the spot. I tried to sing it in my head while I was reading, and then I just gave up halfway through. I was like, ah, I have no idea what's happening. It's it's like in Lord of the Rings when he does all the songs, and you're like, oh, okay, I get it, moving on. Right. But in the movie, it's amazing. So hopefully. <laughs> yeah, except uh, Tom Bombadil's song. You don't know what that sounded like because it wasn't in the movies. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Back to the Somebody's still angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's fine. We could record a whole podcast on why I think it would have been a bad idea. Okay. Uh, my woman stands at her window. Curved lines against square glass. Upraised arms, bent, downfolded. Against sunset red and golded. Come to me, come to me, warm arms of my lass. For me, for me, the warm arms of my lass. The singer stopped reached out a bandaged arm and closed the eyelids of the man. Halleck drew a final soft chord from the palisette, thinking, now we are 73. Bam! Now, that ends the chapter, uh, what are we at, 28 now? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, now we have all the parties involved. Right. We know where everyone's at. Yeah, yeah. Is there anybody that's not accounted for? Um, not that I can think of. Uh, Paul and Jessica are in the desert. Uh, right. The Duke, Duke is dead. Yui is dead. Uh, Idaho is Idaho dead. dead. Gurney is now with the smugglers. Thufer just got caught by the Harkonnens. Mm -hmm. And as we know, He's Kynes... Been is also with the Harkonnens, and they are going to be questioned um, right. together. Right. That is all the people we know. Oh, Piter is dead. Yeah. Uh, the Baron's alive, right. unfortunately. And um, Princess Uruan is somewhere out there waiting to write stuff down. Yeah, she's just out there in the Imperium. One day we will meet her loveliness, and we will get to see who she actually is one day. And then, till then, just her writings. All right. Well, uh, thank you as always for reading Dune with us. Yeah. Um, hit us up on Twitter at reading Dune. Email us, us at reading Dune at gmail.com. Um, also, we want to hear your favorite parts of Dune. We have yeah. so many good moments. There's a bunch of good moments in this chapter. Set us, send us some audio recordings. Send them some video. Yeah. I still want to hear video. I'm like, that would be sick to get someone's face take a break from our faces and we put a video up on our live stream. That would be really cool. So if you feel bold and full of terrible purpose, film a, film a video of your face. Talking to you about your favorite moment. Yeah. This is not about just me and Evan. This is about the tribe of all of us. All of us who are reading Dune together going through this journey. Uh, all right. Well, stay spicy and I'll see you in the next chapter where we go back to Paul and Jessica running through the desert. <laughs>